Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Yes, as you see, I have a big smile because I know that you are tired and for studying work is, uh, all, all over the day. And I, I want to invite you all to stand, please. Please stand and extend your hand and say to your seatmate, so, God loves you all the time. You know, uh, this, this is the opportunity because we know that all of us are too busy in our study for uh, this is an uh, event is for us to worship God. Amen. Amen. Uh, my part for tonight is uh, not to introduce the participant because as you see, we have this game there. But I want to have a read, you know, as you see, this event is, they said this is only for the theology uh, ministry and student. But uh, now I can see there's a lot of different students here in the room. They have COE, uh, NP, what else? Business. Uh, business. Because uh, last night, as uh, Pastor Nanejos, uh, Danilo Nanejos, uh, told us, or they, they lectured us or introduced that God have a different calling for us. Amen? Even though we are teachers or pastors, that is not a hindrance to obey God's word. And for tonight, I will introduce to you our speaker. He is one of the most handsome, I heard that, handsome theology pastor and instructor in our 
department, the Philippine department. Uh, he's uh, my gospel professor. And I learned uh, many things to him in the gospel. None other than he will, uh, the title, uh, we will learn about the uh, falling of Matthew the Levi in this evening. And our speaker for tonight, and before that, I would, I would like to request that uh, if you can turn off your phone or turn it in the light mode to maintain the solemnity of the worship for tonight. Uh, our speaker for tonight is none other than uh, Perna, uh, Pastor Andresito A. Fernando. Okay, maybe some of you are his student. And before I sit, I want to read one of the passages in the Bible. And can you open the Bible in the book of Psalm, chapter 29, verse 2. Uh, it says that, Give unto the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. May God bless us. Good evening. Before we start our inspiration, let's bow our heart for prayer. Our gracious night, Heavenly Father, thank you for this evening, uh, which you have gathered us together to worship you. Please forgive us from our action. In, our, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For our first song, let's sing, Healy That Me. It's the hymn of 537.
Mass of an Hour. In Nari we have on 187, Domini Year. year.
Good evening, everyone. For our prayer focus tonight, please pray for our administrator, faculty, teachers, and mentors as praying example for us, as guiding and helping us to grow in Christ Jesus. Um, the flow of our prayer tonight, um, the song leader will sing a short chorus, and after that, I'll give you two minutes to pray individually, and after that, um, I am the, uh, the song leader will be singing a concluding song, and I am the one to conclude our prayer, and before that, if you bring your Bible, please open with me the book of Job. Job chapter 36, verse 22 to 24. And it says, Behold, God exalted by his power, who teaches like him, who has pre prescribed him his way, or who can say, you have worked iniquity. Remember that you magnify his work, which men behold. That's all. Let's kneel.
Yeah, sorry. We bring back an honor and glory and praises to your child of grace tonight, O Lord, because of your kindness and your goodness and your love and mercy that you have given to us. Lord, before we ask our prayer, please cleanse us because we are not worthy to come to your throne of grace tonight because of our unselfish and unselfishness. Lord, please cleanse us. And I invite your Holy Spirit to be with us, to renew us. And Lord, tonight, please teach us to surrender and to submit ourselves to you because we know that we are not without you. And I will especially to pray for our for your chosen servant, deliver the message tonight. Please use your Holy Spirit to guide them. And I hope that the message that we hear tonight will be a blessing to each one of us. And Lord, thank you for all the things that you've done in our life. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for your grace. And Lord, as we continue to live in this world, I choose us to be a good example to those people around us. And forgive us, O Lord, our sins that committed against you. And this is my prayer. The love of Jesus.
start, uh, let me uh, share with you one uh, uh, writing by uh, Roy Stoke. I don't know if you are familiar with the name. Um, Roy Stoke was one of the professors of uh, Dallas Theological Seminary. He wrote a lot of book on biblical interpretation. But of course, we won't go theological tonight because he would like to be more practical in our week of prayer. But uh, he wrote in his book something that uh, defines what a perfect pastor is. Who is a perfect pastor? Okay? As I would if people would like to know the meaning of a perfect pastor, I think uh, Roy Stook has given a lot of interesting uh, uh, definitions of a uh, perfect pastor. Let me share you some of his, of his uh, ideas. Okay? The first one is that he said that the perfect pastor has been described as one who preaches exactly 20 minutes and then sits down. <laughs> That's a perfect pastor. Right? So if you cannot preach uh, 20 minutes, then it means that uh, you are not perfect. I remember there was a church abroad and this church was uh, it, it, it was having a, um, a time set curtain in the pulpit. In that curt uh, those curtains will automatic automatically close after 20 minutes. Okay, so if you are not uh, uh, a time conscious speaker and then uh, you will speak beyond 20 minutes, then the curtains will close and then you will be left behind. <laughs> and so according to Roy So, he simply said that a perfect pastor is someone who speaks for only 20 minutes and then he sits down. Then he added some more, he said. A perfect pastor condemns sin but never hurts anyone's feelings. Okay, number three. A perfect pastor labors from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. in every kind of work, from preaching to custodial service. A perfect pastor makes a very minimal stipend. It is stipend, right? I don't call it salary, it's stipend per week. And yet, should wear a good, nice clothing. He should buy good books regularly, and he should also have a nice family, drives a good car, and at the same time gives generously to the church. Okay? A good pastor or a perfect pastor stands ready to contribute to every good work that comes along. The ideal pastor should be 26 years old, but has been preaching for 30 years. Okay, so that's another one, no? He said that uh, he at once should be tall and short, okay, tall and short, thin and heavy set, and handsome. He has one brown eye and one blue. His hair is parted in the middle, with left side dark and straight, and the right side brown and wavy. Okay. He has a burning desire to work with teenagers and spend all his time with other folks. He smiles all the time with a straight face because he has a sense of humor that gives him seriously dedicated his work. He makes 15 visits a day on church members but still spends all his time evangelizing that church while he never out of his office. And so those are the characteristics. I don't know if you would like to take the challenge. You know? So the challenge of pastoral pastor ministry is very huge. But let me assure you one thing, that if we accept the challenge, the call of God, and then our God is bigger than those challenges. You agree with me? Okay, that's the good thing about pastoral ministry. Once you have a certain your call to the ministry, I would like to tell you that the call of God would be for you to be able to accomplish these feelings. And so because of that, uh, this uh, week of prayer, we have been told again and again that ministry is a calling from God. Okay? So if you have not been called to this gospel ministry, then probably God has called you to some other lines. But you have to assess yourself before it's too late. Okay, so in our college, we open our, our uh, opportunities so that all of you would be able to know if God has really called you in the gospel ministry. But I do believe that, uh, yes, with your smiles tonight, that you are, you are sure of yourselves that God has called you to the gospel ministry. Now this evening, I would like to share something um, from the Bible, and that is the, the call of Jesus to live by Matthew. Okay, so have you read that portion in your Gospels? The, the Bible says that God, Jesus Christ, called me by Matthew. Now, he, that person has two names, because Levi was his um, uh, Hebrew name, and Matthew was his uh, Greek name. 
And so it's very common during those times that uh, people had two names, you know, Greek and Hebrew. And so Levi Matthew was uh, one of the disciples of Jesus Christ. Uh, he has been called by Christ, but uh, unfortunately, uh, the record about Matthew's life is very meager in the Bible. We can find a lot of, uh, of details about his life. But let me emphasize one thing, that if you're going to read the call of Matthew, you're going to find that event in all of the Synoptic Gospels. It was written by Matthew, it is also found in, in Mark, and also you can find that in the book of Luke. It only shows that the call of Levi Matthew is a significant event in the New Testament. Okay? And so what's in the call of Levi Matthew? Um, I tried to examine, you know, so all of the disciples were called by Jesus Christ except one. Remember that one? Among them there, there was only one who was not called by Jesus. He was uh, Judas. Okay? Judas volunteered himself, but Jesus did not uh, call him. And so Levi Matthew was among those who were called by Jesus. And the Bible says that uh, Jesus Christ, according to the text, let's see probably, uh, let's see the, the text in Mark. I have chosen the Gospel of Mark because the Gospel of Mark is uh, the, the most simple and direct to the point uh, narration of this event. Okay, so we have the Gospel of Mark chapter 2. You have your Bibles with you. Okay, and so it is found in verse uh, 13 onwards. So let's open our Bibles in Mark chapter 2, verses 13 onwards. And the Bible says, Then he went out by the sea. That he refers to, to Jesus, right? And all the multitude came to him, and he taught them. As he passed by, he saw, you like to supply the name? He saw who? Levi. But there is no Matthew. Only the book of Matthew identifies this person as Matthew. All other Gospels simply say Levi, okay? Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. And the Bible says, he rose up and followed Jesus Christ. That's how simple the account of uh, the calling of Matthew, right? But there is something that uh, in this story that really makes the study of this uh, account worth doing tonight. Okay? The first thing is that uh, it's not visible in our English translation. But uh, if we're going to go to the original language, the word follow in that particular text is very deep. I have seen the, the, the invitation of Jesus to Peter, follow me. He said to Andrew, follow me. He said to John, follow me. But uh, all those follow me use a different kind of statement compared to this one. Okay? So if we are going to look at the original language of the word follow me in the Gospel of Mark, then Jesus used a very strong word. Okay? So, and, uh, and this strong word has a lot of meanings. And uh, even the background of Matthew, okay, I do believe that why Christ used this powerful word, apuloteo, is because he wanted to tell Matthew of something very special. Okay? And so Jesus said, follow me. But what is the meaning of the word follow me in that statement of Jesus? Okay, so I'm, I'm going to share with you uh, some meanings. You know? uh, we have our lexicon if you'd like to check. But I have checked the, the meanings of uh, this word. And I found out that it is not only in the lexicon, but they are jiving with the context of uh, the gospel. And so we are safe. We are safe. You know? We are not adding anything to the text. But those meanings just reflect what's in the context. And so because of that, so let, let us now try to reflect on this one. Uh, if you are going to go to some resources, I would like to uh, share with you what I have found uh, with regards to the meaning of follow me. The same, now, now let me reiterate that when Jesus invited Peter, James, John, he used the word follow me, but different wording. But when he invited uh, Levi Macho, he used a specific heavy word, that for Matthew, he had no option but to follow Jesus. Okay, so what is the meaning of this word in Mark chapter 2? I'm going to share with you at least uh, uh, five of them. Okay, five broad meanings of uh, that invitation, follow me. Okay, based on the word used by Jesus in this particular event. 
Okay, so the first word, the first idea of this word when Jesus invited much to follow him is like this way. This word means be like me. Okay? So you can imagine how much you has been shocked. He was a tax collector. Uh, who, who are the tax collectors during those times? They are not uh, they are not uh, liked by their own people, right? They are hated by their own people. But why? Because they are traitors, right? They consider them as uh, collaborators. But here is Jesus telling him, be like me. And so, I, I don't know what was the feeling of Matthew, but he had not, not, nothing to do but to comply and follow Jesus. And so, the, that word, apuloteo, based on the context of the text, is not only an invitation for for Matthew to follow Jesus, but there is a deep meaning behind, and that is, if you would like to follow me, Matthew, be like me. You know? And what, that is one of the most powerful lessons that we can get. You know? I don't know of any reason why we are going to be effective in the ministry without being like Jesus. Okay? Okay? And that is a very, very weighty. It is a very, uh, uh, I heard the word pregnant. I don't know what some, what, why some speakers are using pregnant. You know? But it's pregnant in meaning. Okay? He has said, follow me. Be like me. There are some uh, uh, special uh, mention of these uh, words in other parts of the scriptures. But uh, let, me, let me tell you something. I shared this one to my New Testament class and I would like to reiterate this one because I think this is the most important part of your training. Okay? So in the Gospel Workers, page 94 by Ellen White, he said, Let those who are training for the ministry never forget. Okay? So you might forget uh, Hebrew and Greek or whatsoever. We are going to pass it. Yeah, it even though you are struggling with those languages. But, let, let us have this one. Let those who are training for the ministry never forget okay, that the preparation of the heart is of all the most important. Okay? No amount of mental culture or theological training can take the place of this. Okay, so we cannot substitute that. You know? So it's a very, the most important thing. The bright beams of the sun of righteousness must shine into the heart of the worker and purify his life before light from the throne of God can shine through him to those in darkness. And so if I'm going to ask you one very important question about you, we don't say that theological training is not important. They, it is extremely important. But more important than those uh, knowledge okay, is what? The preparation of what? Our hearts. Now you should ask yourselves, if I prepare not only physically, not only mentally, but spiritually as well. If our hearts are not prepared, please do not go to the ministry. Because the preparation of the heart, according to the gospel workers, is the most important preparation a minister should have. Now, what is the invitation of Jesus to find you? Be like me. Okay, that's the first meaning of uh, the word. No? So we're going to, uh, to go to the next meaning of the word. Akuloteo, uh, okay, in, in, the, in the Greek language, has also another meaning. And the meaning is that to follow with determination. Intentional following. So what's the meaning of that? So we talk about determination and intention. But what does it mean? We follow Jesus Christ because it is our decision. Right? So look at the event. Uh, when, when Matthew heard the call, what did he do? Interestingly, in some other parts of the scriptures, so for example, the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke, they say that Matthew abandoned and left everything to follow Jesus Christ. Okay, did you get the point? So this ministry is a ministry where you are required to sacrifice. <laughs> I don't know if you have that in your vocabulary. Um, it is sad to say that nowadays we are losing that sense of, uh, of sacrifice, right? So sometimes they look at ministry as what? As a simple occupation or business. Huh? Uh, I, I have uh, interviewed one colleague of mine and then he said to me that uh, for me, ministry is my bread and butter. It should be like that. So, so it should be that our task of ministry is sacrifice. Okay? So we are not aiming to we are aiming to be rich. 
Okay? So, if you would like to believe driving a Mercedes Benz or so forth and so on, ministry is not probably in the place. Okay? Because when we follow Jesus Christ, the Bible says that we have to leave what? Everything behind. Okay? So, when, when Jesus Christ told Matthew, follow me, okay? it's another way of saying, Matthew, you have to give up everything and follow me. So let me ask you one question again. Are you willing to leave everything for the sake of the gospel ministry? Yes. Even your even your beloved, uh, shall we say, even those things that you cherish so much. So that is one of the meaning, meanings of Apuloteo. To follow Christ intentionally, with determination. Whatever happens, you know, the Bible says that we have to follow Jesus Christ. Our hearts must be tuned with God always. Have you heard of the story of we are about the so have you heard the story of a man who was about to attend the costume party? Have you heard of that man? And the man decided to to wear Satan's attire. And so he he, he had the uh, horns and uh, the appearance of the man was very very much like Satan. Okay? And while he was going to the party, there was a strong rain that hampered his walk. And so he was looking for a building where he could find shelter. And it so happened that he saw one, it was a church, you know, church. And the church was having service. And so that man had no other choice but to enter that building, the church. And so happened that uh, many Christians were there worshiping God. And the pastor was preaching during that time. It so happened that the topic of the pastor was, we should fight Satan by all means. And here comes you know, the man. <laughs> and he entered the, the door of the church wearing the full suit of Satan. And the pastor saw him. And he said, brothers and sisters, here comes Satan. <laughs> and so the pastor was the first to run. Okay, and uh, all other members ran away. Some even used the windows. You know? They jumped through the windows in order to escape. But there was a very old woman. She cannot run because she was too old. <laughs> and so even the, the one taking care of her left her. And so she was covering for fear. And she saw Satan coming beautiful. And so, but before the man, that man who had the caution of Satan could utter even a single word, the woman said, No, don't, don't come close to me, Satan. Because I would like to assure you that even though I have been in the church for more than 50 years, my heart, my heart always belongs to you. <laughs> what a sad confession, right? What a sad confession. Imagine that one, you know? For 50 years of going to church, the heart of that woman belongs to me. <laughs> and so, remember my um, uh, brothers, sisters, uh, all of you who are preparing the ministry. There are not, not theology students in the, in the, in the midst, you know? So, in our midst today, let me tell you that what is important to follow God is our total commitment. Akuloteo means be willing to leave behind all things that hinder us from obeying God's meaning. So let's go to the next one, the third meaning of uh, this one. No? Akoloteo in, in the Greek also means, now you know the meaning of, you know, you encounter the word luo, right? Luo. Luo means uh, I, lose. I, lose. I lose. And there are some, uh, some Greek grammar, uh, grammars who, which take uh, this word. No? And uh, it's a ministry of losing. What does it mean? According to your call to the ministry is a ministry of losing. Our message is a message of, li of liberation. We are to help others to, set, to, be, to, to be free from the bondage of sin. That's the reason why, if you're going to see the context of Matthew chapter 2, you're going to see that. Look at the, the following verse. Verse uh, 15. Now it happened, the Bible says, he was dining in Levi's house, but uh, who are the guests? Many tax collectors and sinners huh, also sat together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. Question, what made these people present in that occasion? Because they were invited. But who invited them? It's a Levi. Yeah. And so we have an example of how our ministry is a, is a ministry of liberation. It is a ministry where we should, where we, we should call people back and release them from the bondage of sin. 
therefore, we would like to emphasize that uh, our calling is primarily soul winning, right? If we want souls for Christ, then uh, we cannot claim that we have been called by God. Okay? Uh, and let, let me let me know, let me call to you one uh, quotation again from the Acts of the Apostles, page 328, you know? The Bible, uh, this uh, book says, The conversion of sinners and their sanctification through the truth is the strongest proof a minister can have that God has called him to the ministry. So what does it mean? You know? It's a very powerful statement. Uh, this book says, the Spirit of Prophecy says, what is the strongest proof that God has called you to the ministry? Question line? No? 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 It's all we need. Souls converted to Christ according to Ellen G. White. And their sanctification to the truth is the strongest proof that God has called you to the gospel ministry. And so, why don't we take the challenge? You know? So when we go out of this uh, room, when we meet people, why not we perform the ministry of liberation? Luo, to set free, to lose. You know? Because Jesus called Matthew not only to follow him, but he called Matthew to what? To win souls. Okay? And so that's why uh, I would like to encourage everyone that make soul winning as your priority in your ministry. Okay? So, uh, we have mentioned in our class that the number one agenda in the church board is not social life. What is the number one agenda? Mission, so right? And so, if your church board meets every Sabbath, even every Sabbath, but there's no agenda of evangelism in the church board, I tell you, your meeting may not be pleasing God. Because our number one agenda is no other than so meaning. And so, we have this one, it's the idea of Akuluteo in the, in the last one. And so, the, the third one, we don't have much time. Now, now, this word, if you are going to add something at the beginning, we call it prefix in our, in our study of language, then it would, it would change its meaning to a more broad and deeper sense. The word akuloteo, when, when uh, act is added before it, then it would mean to follow till the end. To follow till the end. And so what does it mean? Ministry is a lifetime call. Okay, are we together? So it means that if God has called you really in the ministry, then your understanding of ministry is lifetime. Hindi yung pastor na ako bukas, then next time hindi na. Okay, so our calling should be as long as we live. It is a lifetime commitment to God. Now, the, the sad thing is like this. No? I was looking for uh, this, the life of Matthew, but uh, I couldn't find any additional detail in our Bible. When Jesus Christ rose from the dead, there is no more detail about Matthew's life. Did you find one? No. Wala, no? Wala, no? And so, what we can do is just to rely on some sources. Uh, maybe reliable, maybe subject to some suspicions, but at least we have some data. No? Um, tradition tells us that Matthew spent some of his time but he likes his fellow Jews. But later on, he departed and he went to far places, according to uh, um, the Roman Catholics and the Orthodox are saying that man should die a martyr's death. He died as a martyr. Uh, but how and where, we don't know. Uh, I have a book in my house in, uh, with a title, uh, uh, Death of Martyrs, written by John Fox. And he said that Machu went to Parcha and he died there as a martyr. Okay? In other words, uh, traditions uh, are unanimous saying that Matthew followed Jesus till the end of his life. It is a lifelong journey. You know? And that makes ministry a very challenging, at the same time, interesting work. Because our calling is lifetime. Okay? Once a pastor should always be a pastor. But if you have some inkling to, to think of something else, uh, assess yourself if you have been called by God. But when you consider your call as a lifelong ministry, that, is, that, that means that God has called you. Okay? And so we have that one. Now the last part that I'm going to share with you because of our time is not uh, so long, is that this word is an invitation to leave a lasting legacy. So what do you mean by legacy? 
um, take us in time. It's something that the, you yourself and others will never forget. You know? It's good for Matthew because he wrote a book. Had Matthew not written any book, we would not have known him. You know? Or probably a little bit. But Matthew, according to, to what we have seen in our Gospel, wrote a very informative book, the Gospel of Matthew, and that was his legacy, right? Okay, so uh, there is a book saying that in order for you to be remembered always, you write a book, or you plant a tree, or whatsoever. But not all of us can be authors. You know? Sometimes we don't have time to write a book. But let me tell you something, that winning stones for Jesus could be your legacy. You know? And you would find a lot of people remembering you in your gospel ministry. And that will give you joy in your ministry. Uh, the, the thing is that you are too young to appreciate that, but all of us who are members of the College of Theology, we are getting old already. So we are in the process of seeing to it that at the end of our ministry, we have something to think about when we get old. You know? So we would like to, to see our staff sitting on a rocking chair, and remembering all those good old days you know, that, that uh, happened in our lives. Now, since you are young, it's time for you to build memories and take a seat to your members. You know? And when Christ comes again, and for example, all of us will go to heaven, I do believe that many will embrace you for what we saw. Because they will thank you. Because you, you were the one used by God for them to be in heaven. Okay, so that's a good thing. And that's legacy. Okay? So it, you, you can build a lifetime legacy or even legacy for eternity if we serve the Lord without reservation. And that's a good thing. You know? So b before I end, let, let me share with you one, um, one experience of mine. Um, I was conducting a evangelistic meeting in uh, Yabesiha. Okay, I don't know if you have been there in that place. Maybe some of you came from that <laughs> province. Uh, it was uh, 1990, so something like that. And uh, uh, we entered a very uh, virgin, or shall we say, a territory without any Adventist presence. And so it's quite challenging. You know? when, when, after your graduation, most of you will be planting churches, not planting corn, according to Pastor Brown last night. You know? So I do hope that all of you will plant your churches. You know? And then, uh, I remember, I remember that. Uh, when we came to the place, we had a very difficult problem. Where would be our base? Because there was no address. No, no church. No, not even a member was there. And so, we were thinking, while we were praying for a particular base, then there was an old lady who approached us. And she invited us to, to, uh, what? to, to, uh, to, to make her home our, our base, the evangelist. And we were so happy. Imagine this old lady volunteered, and she said, "Come to my house. I'm going to uh, to uh, give you space, and you can uh, prepare everything in my house, plus your lunch and dinner and breakfast are free." Okay, we're so happy there, you know? so we found the lady. And uh, to my surprise, when she prepared uh, our beddings uh, at night, she prepared a very special, uh, you know, bed you know, for all of us. And uh, she served a lot of delicious food, and she entered in us very, very well and, uh, during all those uh, days that we have stayed in the place. Now, before the end of our evangelistic meeting, the lady, that old lady of 70 years old, okay, told me, um, Pastor, I, have, I am going to confess something to you. I was a former activist. I was baptized when I was still a teenager. But I married uh, a non-Adventist uh, uh, husband, and so I was married uh, and I backslided. And so it's only now that uh, I have the opportunity again to have some contacts with Adventists. And so the reason why I opened my house is because I feel that God is calling me back to the church. You know? and, uh, and that lady was crying. You know? uh, we feel the sincerity of her statements. And, uh, she said, Pastor, I would like to request that I will be one of those who will get baptized the following Sabbath, the baptism. Okay? And we were so happy, you know? We shed tears because we saw in that lady that uh, desire to return back to God. She was a former Adventist, backslided for about 50 years, something like that. 
And then she decided to return back to the church and she got baptized at the end of the wedding uh, with some other uh, new converts. And then I was transferred to another continent, uh, another, another field, I mean. And then uh, after about five or ten years, I decided to revisit the place. And the first thing that I had, in, the, the first thing that I had in my mind is to visit the lady, that, that old woman. And so I came to her house, but uh, I couldn't find her anymore. What I met, who I met in that house was uh, her, uh, her apo, uh, granddaughter. And I asked her granddaughter, where is uh, Nana? And the granddaughter said, sorry for because she passed away a year ago. She died. But the granddaughter told me that she died happily. And she said, I praise God because of uh, the ministry of St. And so we're so happy, you know, so we turned back so happy because even though that uh, lady died, but she died with the hope and faith. Right? That's good thing. And I, I would like to tell you that uh, the thing that will not uh, be taken away from you is your happiness. You know? when you and so build legacy. Your call to the ministry is uh, building legacy that won't last. It would be, I mean, that will not last, uh, but it will be forever. Okay? Th there is a lasting legacy that should be made and built by us. And so that is the, the meaning of God's call to each and every one of us. And so maybe that's the reason, those are the reasons why the call of Matthew has been included in the gospel. Are we together? So let's, let's record those uh, meanings. A unique word that Jesus used for, for Matthew. Okay? Number one, a kuloteo means what? Huh? Be like me. If God is called you to the ministry, be like him. Otherwise, you won't be an effective witness for him. Number two, follow me intentionally, with determination, willing to leave everything behind for the sake of the gospel. Right? Number three, Okay, a kuloteo means to lose those souls who are bandaged, who are in bandage of sin. So we lose, we, we liberate them by the gospel message. Okay, number four. Okay, what's number four? Okay, so before that, there's another one, right? Number four is that, a means, what? Huh, what is that? It is a lifetime commitment. No, no. So when God called you, for example, if you have experienced God call, so your commitment should be like that. And number five, a kudoteo means building a legacy for eternity. And uh, before we end, let me remind you of Eloquent statement. A man can receive no higher honor than to be accepted by God as an able minister of the gospel, the strong gospel workers, and also as a and so I do hope, and I do hope, that the remaining nights that we're going to have, tomorrow and, uh, tomorrow and Sabbath, and so forth and so on, all of those messages that will be shared to us will be some sort of strengthening our foundation that God has indeed called us into the gospel ministry. Okay, God bless you all. Amen. Amen.
our loving God, we would like to praise your name. We would like to glorify you because you have called us to this special and high calling. We would like to thank you so much for giving us this detail of the life of Matthew. And we would like to praise you because our calling includes a lot of things that would make us not only us happy, but also those souls who are clamoring for truth will be able to understand the deep message of the gospel. We would like, Lord, to recommit ourselves to you. We have sometimes looked down to the, to the call of, of ministry. But now, Lord, we have realized that there is no higher calling but to get involved in the ministry of the gospel. And so I pray that these young students, they are preparing for the ministry. I pray that, that you would continually endow them with such commitment and sense of calling so that when they go out from this campus, from this university, that they, they would become not only effective, but as well as models of uh, our Savior in presenting to the world the good news of the one who will come again in the future. Thank you, Lord, for the assurance that our gathering tonight will be blessed by you, and all of us will depart from this place with the assurance that you will always be with us, and you will always use us for your work. Thank you for hearing our prayers, Lord. We ask all of this in the loving name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, God bless.